sing the intro to that. Hey Sam. What are we going to do today? Brick as a brick, cause it's thick as a brick. Thick as a brick, live at Madison Square Garden. But we're not reviewing that. Yeah. Thick as a brick, yes. So uh, we're more into, into our own territory now in that. With that kind of nip, we just didn't have anything to say. It was a good album. <laughs> well, it's thick as a brick. It's quite a challenging album to review because it's so deliberately obtuse <laughs> and convoluted. Huge jumping complexity, a leap from from um, Aqualung. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, a gradual shift in complexity so much as a burp. Deliberately, because it's a satire. It's, 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 it has comedy value. It, it, the whole point of it, you know, people were saying Aqualung. Oh, it's another great concept album. Um, it isn't at all. So obviously the, the response is in, in you know early seventies Pythonian land is to make the most ridiculous over the top concept album concept album definitely concept album as much as possible and it's almost for that reason that makes it one of the most definitive prog moments you know it's it's as important as the lamb for me you know it, it's that good so in many ways it's, it's a definitive moment it's interesting how it hasn't gone down in tall history as like the album everyone knows. The album everyone knows is Aqualung, but well, that's probably what, what I just said is probably the reason for that. Is it's, it's so convoluted. It's a real minefield for critics. I don't know. How, I, I can't imagine how they skirt around this because how do they deal with the fact that it's got the humour and it's poking fun at prog, but it also is prog and is really good, which is a wonderful thing, obviously. But for, for critics who want to deride it, that must be very difficult. So I don't know if they just pretend it's not there or or something. So like I said, com convoluted piece, all these multiple themes, it's all going going all over the place. It's quite complex. They got more complex after this, actually. Um, I don't just mean passion play, I mean generally. But it's not until you sit down and work it out, and there's some really odd metres and there's a funny number of bars for things in it, and yet it's so accessible. For me, I put it on like, and loved it straight away. But it does go through a journey, and by the end, they've kind of got to where Jethro Tull were going next, actually, which is... Slightly less melodic, heavier, uh, less pleasant direction, but it leads you through it in, in a lovely way. The reason for that is, of course, is that it, w it wasn't actually prepared properly. They, they had a, two weeks of, of time to rehearse the song, so Ian Anderson just pretended he'd written it, and each day they would come back and he'd just write a new bit, and then he'd write a new bit, and it was actually written like that as new bit, new bit, new bit, new bit. But because of the, the theme of it, of it being a, a parody, that actually works really well, and it's quite funny, and it and well, that's right. Because he happened to be at sort of the peak of his his creative ability, he would come out with these fantastic melodies over and over every day, you know. And then they return to another one, and then return to this one, and then you know, brilliant album, accessible album, two twenty plus sides that fit together into one massive piece. You know, it's it's forty three, forty four minutes of one piece, and it's fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, accessible is 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 a word I'd use. I don't I don't fully understand it. You say so, and I've heard the the phrase Monty Python's version of a sort of concept album, but it's far too good to be a Monty Python concept album. Obviously, the artwork and stuff like that is very Python esque. The humour is not obvious. Is I it? don't think. No, I don't think you. Okay. If you just listen to the album, I don't think the humour is very obvious. And I mean, a lot of people view it as a very good concept album. They don't. I, I don't think actually clock the fact that it's it's poking fun at anything part of the reason mm. of that is maybe because first on, on first listening he, his vocals are very harmonized mm. i presume he either double tracks or triple tracks or quadruple tracks or something like that which it sounds really good but it makes it very difficult to actually pick out the words so it sounds more more like he's harmonizing with the music rather than actually singing a melody and actually saying something so without actually being able to hear what he's saying i suppose yeah but even then, it's not it's not particularly clear because it's some kind of... Um, but the fact that it's not clear, apocryphal. that's quite funny. I don't know what it's about. I'm not no, sure. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, <some, laughs> it's supposed to be some kid's poem, you know. Kid's poem, yeah. 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 Gerald Bostock, 12-year-old boy, 
Gerald Bostock wrote these lyrics. Uh, wrote these <laughs> lyrics. But it's, it's just on the edge. I actually, I, you know, I have sympathy for what he's trying to do in his project because, you know, I listen to some of the stuff that Yes go on about, and as you know, yeah. I think, what the You know, he just sings. I mean, there's a, there's a lyric that is clear quite earlier on. I can, what is it? It's, I, can, I can make you feel, but I can't make you think. Mm. Which I think is a kind of a sum up of the criticism of those prog albums. Yeah. They're trying to do very highbrow sort of um, things to try and imbue the music with some kind of profundity, which just isn't there, which you can't do with music. Music is pretty emotive. It's about bringing, bringing emotions on. Yeah, you, you, can't, um, you can't fake that. And it, and can it... music make you think? I don't think I, I think musicians can think about music. So if there's something particularly interesting going on, like you say, interesting meter and yeah. and stuff like that, that will make a musician think about well, what are the confines of music? But for your normal listener, that, you can't. You can't it, yeah, put, I mean that, that, that's the point, isn't it? Is that you know that weird meter? What what does it actually do? I mean, there's whole books written on this, isn't there? You know, I mean, does it make you feel a certain type of emotion, or do, you know, does a musician actually feel a different type of emotion upon hearing that? I think a lot of it is it, you really like it. it. You feel these emotions, but you don't necessarily know why. And if it was simpler, those emotions wouldn't be there. I mean, for starting, it'd be boring, wouldn't it? All that that long music. This is the thing about it at all. I find it incredibly flat. Actually, I mean, I think we I think we spoke about it in Aqualung about how there's sort of there's not the the big lows and the the great highs that you get with sort of like Pink Floyd and things like that. No, yeah, a massive range of uh, emotion. It's very sort of steady. It's very high. It's very high level, high quality in that it's maintained all the way through the album. But in the sense of actually S- subtler emotions, yeah. yeah, yeah, in that Floyd is. Or it's not such a yeah, it's when, not such an emotional roller coaster. Yeah, it's, um, it's 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 a I would argue it's a it's a bigger range of weirder emotions, different yeah. emotions. It's enjoyable nonetheless. If the purpose of the album was to do sort of like a, a Python esque take on concept albums and prog, I'd uh, I'd say it's an epic failure because I do just do not get Python from it at all, apart from. Which is why, you know, I listen to a digital version, so I don't get the cover. I was kind of mm. interested in the cover because obviously there's a lot in there. But, you know, if I was to go Python, I'd actually think something like Captain Beefheart. <laughs> now, that, gives, <laughs> that gives me a, a, a Monty Python sort of vibe. But as a... I suppose the problem is now, it just sounds like Jeff Tull. Because subsequently after this, of course, that this this was done, let's make it really complicated as a parody. But following this, obviously Jeff Tull continued to be that complicated, you know, and didn't really go back. Not really. So it sounds like Jethro Tull. But at the same time, there's, there's actually a very diverse range of styles in there. You know, I mean, we did um, Scenes from a Memory a couple of weeks ago, which is quite narrow. You know, you've got Proggy metallic ness epic song. Proggy metallic ness epic song. But this, there's all sorts of stuff going on. You've got some quite, quite heavy bits in there. You know, sort of speed metal is almost in there at one point. You know, kind of stuff. And then obviously you've got the folk, and then you've got sort of heavy rock stuff going on and then you've got quite there's quite an avant-garde bit the, the start of the second side so you know you've got, you've got a wide range of types of music in there, but you're right it, it's very you think of it and you think of it as one thing yeah you can almost you think, think oh, there's the bit that goes yeah. up and then and then you know you can almost think oh they're tulling yeah. for 40 minutes however long yeah. it is but of course when they made it they weren't tulling they were doing something that was actually different to the previous four albums now, although I've been a little bit critical I'm not saying this is a bad album I actually enjoy it I've listened to it a lot this week, and we've seen we went to see it live, didn't they? Yeah. In Anderson did a tour of Thick as Brick and Thick as Brick Part Two. Yeah, and we went to watch that. The thing that struck me from that show is, you know, I came away from it relatively fresh. I mean, I'd, I'd listened to it on the on the build up to the to the concert, but it, it struck me as I come away that there was nothing particularly memorable about it. There's no, there's no one point I could say, you know, I remember. Oh my god, I remember that. That, that was fantastic. Mm. Whereas. But I think that just speaks to the the consistency. Yeah, that's the thing. Because yeah. it, it was written the way it was, and it was like he was coming out with another fantastic melody, another fantastic melody, another, and it just keeps going. And then it references the last one, but in a sort of cool way, and then you know. And he could have done that. And if the melodies weren't that good, but the parody element was there, it, it would have been entertaining. But it wouldn't have been oh, awesome. It's just because the tunes are brilliant. The thing was, of course, when we went to see it, and of course they recorded it, and there's a DVD and a Blu-ray was that on the album you only get, you don't get the full show. You hear about these shows of Thick as a Brick and people try to reconstruct from audience re- recordings and things. There isn't even a, an audio recording of this tour where they did the whole thing. And there was a lot of messing around. And I mean, the, the, the famous bit, of course, is they stop at a really si- silly moment in the music 
and the phone's ringing and they answer it and it's, it's for, I can't remember the guy's name, but some, someone or other. It turns out that this, this guy is actually one of the roadies and then he comes on in a, in a diving costume and a, a, an, an aquilum and has to answer the phone <laughs> and all this kind of stuff and they had a tent and they all climbed in the tent and was all shuffling around. Apparently it changed a lot over time as, as they were doing it. We kind of got that but it was, it was a, an old man's version of it. And I, get, I sense on the actual thick as a brick tour, it kind of changed. You know, they're, they're like a man in a gorilla suit walking around in the audience, which we wouldn't have got when we saw it because they would have probably would have been in Anderson would have vetoed that and thought, well, that's that's just silly. <laughs> and a lot of that pythoniness would have come from that as well. Yeah. It's not there on the album, which is such a shame. And we don't, you know, I've never heard. I did, we didn't see it. We saw a different one, which was great. Um, I did. It was interesting how it works so well as a live performance. It is in the direction of like the wall, not as much. Seeing the wall live is 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 just jaw dropping. It works better as a show than as an album, particularly with all the messing around. Whereas Things a Bit Two, they just played the album and it was kind of oh, that was alright. Yeah. So that was a str- that was a strange thing. But yeah, so supposedly, so Ian Anderson pretended he'd written it and hadn't really, and would have to get up early in the morning and write the new bit, and then they go into the studio and play it. But the making of the album. I mean, this version of the, the, the album has got actually an interview on it. I bet that interview isn't on the new one. They keep doing that. It sounds ever so pythonish, the, make, the making of the album, because apparently it was pretty grim where they had to go in. It was in Putney, which, I don't know, is that funny? I might be thinking of Black Adder. <laughs> Tell me, young crone, is this Putney? Baby. And they had to go to this cafe for their dinner, and it was like this great big woman with a moustache. Do you want spam? <laughs> you know, and, and, and you can imagine it, you know, and... and Supposedly at one point, because they, they were completely knackered, they were doing this every day, trying to construct this ridiculous thing. I think they had like two weeks before they had to go into the studio to record it. So Ian Anderson said, right, out we go, let's go for a run. <laughs> they got about 100 yards and it went back in and things like that. So it, it, that sounded really funny, but it's all lost in the midst of time and that nothing was recorded, nothing, you know, which is such a shame. I thought the story was that this was recorded in a week. Yes, it was. But yeah, that was the rehearsal. Yeah. So when they went and did it, they pretty much just played it. They didn't play it in one go, but they played it. That's still pretty unbelievable. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. But of course, that was a, they, they could never have done that. Don't think as a brick the way they did Aquila. But the thing with Aquila was that actually a lot of that guitar, I think maybe even drums as well. I don't know if they overdubbed afterwards, but it sounds like a lot of it is actually in Anderson playing all the parts because he. he um, he struggled to tell, you know, communicate with them what, what he actually wanted. Um, so it's a very different album. That, so I think a lot, maybe a lot of the sort of dryness of Aqualung is maybe down to that, as well as the dodgy recording quality. Whereas this is just open and alive. It sounds great. I'm not a big uh, Martin Bure fan, which is which is, turns out is actually controversial. I've never been that impressed with him. I always got the impression that he's he's good at working with Ian Anderson and he does what he does and that's fine. But there's big fans of him out there, and I, I see what he contributes. The heavy rockiness, uh, the heaviness, what there is of it, comes from him. Uh, noisy guitariness, which obviously doesn't come from Ian Anderson. So that's quite important, particularly on the, over the next few albums, um, including this one. Obviously, his big famous solo. So you know, Martin Bray's signature solo is Aqualung. Now, I don't think that's a good solo at all. Maybe I'm wrong, but it turns out. I should have said this last week actually, but um, while he's playing the actual solo that is on the album, Jimmy Page comes into the control room and says, "Hello." <laughs> so he's having to play the solo, and he can't wave back because he's playing the solo. You can almost hear it in the playing. <laughs> That's quite funny. But yeah, this, this is awesome. I, I, you know, if you like prog, this is one of those albums. You know, um, Dark Side of the Moon, The Lamb, I suppose Brain Salad Surgery, I suppose Red. I don't know, you know. I mean, I don't think I'm going to get much more from this over repeated listenings as I've gotten from from those other albums, apart from Brain Salad Surgery. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, there is an element of that, and that it's it is lighter than the following album. The next album, they they kind of did it for real. It wasn't a parody, and that's a that's a different story. But I've never got bored of it. it has to be said, I've never got bored of it. So we're going to give it some eggs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the one thing I don't like is that he has to sing about sperm. <laughs> which is disgusting I don't like it when people sing about sperm David Coverdale sung about sperm as well and that was disgusting David Coverdale it is six eggs but there's a little bit down from there because of sperm that. in the gutter yeah yeah I'm going to go five I, I really do enjoy it but I don't put it on a pedestal I think a six egg album has got to go on a bit of a pedestal yeah I can understand why you like it I put it on yeah. a bit of a pedestal but I'm going to go five and that's it thank you very much we'll see you next week don't be disappointed. We're not doing Passion Play. We're not doing War Child. Don't ask for us to do those. We're not doing them. No. No. It's not happening. Stop. Um, but we are doing Minstrel in the Gallery. So we'll see you next week for that one.